Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about elephants in captivity. To start off with, I'm going to talk about some elephants that didn't start off in captivity. Taking animals from the wild and placing them in zoos has been a thing of the past for many decades now. That is because a number of the animals that are highly sought after by zoos are now protected by the Endangered Species Act and cannot be removed from the wild, but it is also because it is just frowned upon for animals to be removed from their homes and placed in confinement. Confinement. Fortunately for zoos, they were able to take the majority of animals from the wild in the mid to late 1900s. They then created breeding programs and zoos shared animals amongst themselves to diversify the gene pool. But one animal's gene pool that continues to dwindle in captivity is the elephant. Elephants struggled and still continue to struggle to adhere to a captive lifestyle. There has been failed breeding programs programs diseases plaguing the majority of captive elephants, ailments related to captivity, and many more issues. That is why there has never been a sustainable elephant population in zoos. So if zoos ever get the opportunity to get new elephants from the wild, they take it. In 2016, there were 35 African elephants in Eswatini that were supposedly threatened by habitat loss and drought. Not only that, but big Game Parks, the entity responsible for elephant conservation, was also concerned that the elephants were getting in the way of their black and white rhino conservation. So to prevent further degradation to the land and to free up some space for the critically endangered rhinos, they wanted to cull 18 of the country's 35 elephants. But instead of killing the elephants, they decided to relocate them to three zoos in the United States. The Dallas Zoo, Omaha's Henry Dawley Zoo, and the Sedgwick County Zoo in Wichita. In July 2015, the 18 elephants had been moved from national parks to temporary holding areas, where they were fed hay trucked in from South Africa. During that time, their feed and care was partially paid for by those zoos. As payment for the elephants, those zoos were going to pay $450,000 towards the rhino conservation programs over the following five years. In September 2015, officials in Eswatini and the zoos created a campaign called Room for Rhinos. The zoos needed the public to understand why they needed to take animals from the wild and place them in zoos, and they also needed to convince the United States Fish and Wildlife Service to allow the elephants in the country. On the website they made for the campaign, they talked about the drought and the negative impact the elephants were having on the environment. It also shared photos like this, showing the difference between the vegetation where the elephants were being held and the greenery on the outside of the perimeter, showing the supposed degradation of the land. And Ted Riley, the founder of the Big Game Parks Trust, explained that the elephants are negatively impacting the rhinos. They forage the same um, uh, food matter, and too many elephants would impact negatively on your, on your uh, black rhino, which are rare. He also talked about why the elephants couldn't be sent to other countries in Africa. Um, in the countries which are managing to um, protect their elephants, the elephants are breeding and becoming a problem. They're, they're not rare animals in southern Africa. They're, they're problem animals. So they definitely made it seem as though the only option was to send them to zoos in the United States. But there was a big movement to try and stop that from happening because it was believed that that wasn't the only option. Some of the first to act were the animal rights groups. In November, Peter, Paws, and Animal Legal Defense Fund wrote a letter to the United States Wildlife Service urging them to object the application to import the elephants. They wrote a huge document that cited the stress from captivity, transport, and splitting up elephant families, and said that the zoos were not suitably equipped to house them. Then 75 elephant experts put together an open letter expressing their outrage. After an investigation, they determined that 35 elephants posed no considerable threat to other wildlife and that no evidence had been presented 
presented to show significant habitat competition with rhinos. But nothing worked and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service approved the transport of 15 female African elephants and 3 male African elephants. Then the elephants were given a bit of a lifeline. The Singapore-based company GroupElephant.com offered Big Game Parks the $450,000 that the three zoos were offering them. They also offered to assist in the care of the elephants, including the implementation of a contraception program. The group further stated that it would be willing to translocate the elephants to a safe and well-monitored reserve within South Africa. The only stipulation attached to the offer was that big game parks would not be allowed to sell any more elephants in the future, but the offer was not accepted. Then the animal advocacy group Friends of Animals filed a lawsuit against the Fish and Wildlife Service challenging the grounds on which the permit was issued for the transport. A hearing had been set for March 17, 2016. The transport of the elephants wasn't scheduled until May, so everything was going to line up perfectly. That was until the zoos decided to make an unannounced decision. They secretly organized the transport of the animals on March 8th to render the hearing redundant. The elephants were herded into a smaller area in preparation for the flight to the United States and were being loaded into crates and readied for sedation. Someone a part of the project took photos of what was happening and gave them to a concerned concitizen. That person then sent the photos to the Friends of Animals attorney. Friends of Animals acted quickly and immediately requested a temporary restraining order to halt the import but the district court judge denied the request because the elephants had already been sedated for the flight. Friends of Animals accepted defeat and calls the elephants the stolen 18. But it was actually only 17 elephants that made the flight. The Dallas Zoo's explanation for what happened to the 18th elephant was that it died from gastrointestinal issues in December 2015. The Dallas Zoo also made a statement in regards to the allegations that they arranged the transport secretly to avoid the lawsuit. They said, we are outraged at claims by animal extremists that these elephants were moved suddenly to circumvent their misguided efforts to delay this move via a lawsuit. We could not stand by and let these activists endanger the lives of these elephants with delaying tactics. After the flight, the elephants were loaded onto trucks with a police escort and taken to the three zoos. The zoo in Dallas received five elephants and the zoos in Nebraska and Kansas received six each. And the zoos built special habitats for the elephants to live out the rest of their lives. But if the vast majority of elephants in captivity were any indication for how long their lives would be in a zoo, they wouldn't be living long lives at all. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Foom. Foom is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device. There is no vapor involved. It is strictly just flavored air and it's completely natural. There's no harmful chemicals and Foom uses all natural, delicious flavors. Foom really makes replacing your bad habit easy. My personal favorite flavors were orange, vanilla, and sparkling grapefruit. I love citrus flavors but sometimes it can be sort of hit or miss, but these ones were definitely a hit. Your foam comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing while breaking your habit. All around, there is just so many benefits to a foam. It's the start of the year, so if you have been putting off trying to break your bad habit, now is the perfect time to start. Head to tryfoom.com slash SidDewire or scan the QR code on the screen and use code SIDDWIRE to get 10% off the journey pack today. But that is not the only thing Foom has to offer. The Foom Solano launched last November. You can upgrade your journey pack to the Solano to enjoy the premium walnut barrel and onyx black coated mouthpiece that has a smoother finish and still get 10% off. That is tryfum.com and use code SIDDWIRE to get an additional 10% off your order today. Okay, back to the video. So there is a host of reasons why elephants struggle to have a long life in captivity. In captivity, they are completely robbed of the kind of life they would get in the wild, where they can live as old as 
humans do. Wild herds can roam up to 50 miles a day, and within these herds there are intense, lifelong family and social bonds. They communicate with each other through a variety of vocalizations and through gestures that can be slight anglings of the head, body and feet, or the subtle waving of their trunks. And they can even sense each other through vibrations in the ground. They have sensors in the padding of their feet, so if there is a problem with a member of the herd, the elephants will come to their aid. And despite these strong emotional bonds, zoos routinely break up herds to send them to other zoos for breeding purposes. And that was a large reason why animal advocates didn't want the elephants from Eswatini to go to zoos. Not only was the act of sending them to the United States breaking them up, but then they would be further broken up within zoos. But the zoos actually assured the public that the elephants wouldn't be broken up any further. But the Dallas Zoo broke their promise in October 2018. A mother, Nawazi, and her daughter, Amar, were sent to the Fresno Chaff Zoo in California to help that zoo grow its herd. And when that amount of distress is caused to these highly emotionally intelligent animals, it's not surprising to hear about all of the issues that elephants have in captivity. In 2012, the Seattle Times did an analysis of 390 elephant facilities at accredited US zoos for the past 50 years. It found that most of the elephants Elephants died from injuries or diseases linked to conditions of their captivity, specifically from chronic foot problems caused by standing on hard surfaces and musculoskeletal disorders from inactivity caused by being penned or chained for days and weeks at a time. Of the 321 elephant deaths that the Times did have complete records for, half died by the age of 23, which was more than a quarter of a century before their expected lifespans. And for every elephant born in a zoo, on average, another two die. The first thing that shocked me to a great extent was the number of problems and the amount and scale of, of the problems of foot rot and uh, the, the, the percentage of deaths that came from elephants having problems with their feet in zoos. A function of the, the weight of the elephants and the, and the surface yes. in the zoo? But the public's perception of elephants in zoos actually shifted a lot sooner than 2012 when the Seattle Times did that investigation because in 2003 the importation of wild elephants was dramatically slowed. That was believed to be done because of the immense pressure from animal welfare groups worldwide and the amount of scientific evidence evidence that proved that elephants did not thrive in zoos. And then in 2004, with less and less elephants being brought into the United States, a zoo did something that was highly frowned upon by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is the entity that is responsible for accrediting zoos and aquariums with high standards. The Detroit Zoo, an AZA accredited zoo, was the first major zoo in the United States to shut down their elephant exhibit on ethical grounds. They shut the exhibit down and gave their elephants to a non-profit sanctuary. The zoo director said cold weather and captivity took too high a toll on its elephants. With the number of elephants in zoos declining, the AZA needed all of the elephants to stay in zoos for possible breeding purposes or to be exhibited in other zoos. The elephants were seen as too valuable in zoos to just be given away to a sanctuary. So the AZA did try and block those elephants from going to a sanctuary and said that they had to go to the Columbus Zoo in Ohio instead. And if the Detroit Zoo didn't do that, then they would be at risk of losing their accreditation. But the Detroit Zoo sent them to the sanctuary anyway. Other zoos actually started to follow the Detroit Zoo's lead. Two years later, the Bronx Zoo announced that it would close its exhibit once its three elephants died. The zoo in Seattle, San Francisco, and Chicago also announced that they had plans to phase their elephant exhibits out as well. In 2011, a similar situation to the Detroit Zoo happened at the Toronto Zoo in Canada. The local council overruled the zoo and voted to send the elephants to a sanctuary in California. Then in retaliation, the AZA did what they threatened to do to the Detroit Zoo. 
they yanked the Toronto Zoo's accreditation. In 2005, after there was outrage when a bunch of elephants unexpectedly died in zoos, the AZA attempted to change the perception of elephants in zoos. A private two-day meeting with representatives from dozens of zoos that housed elephants was organized. According to the documents that the Seattle Times pulled, all agreed the death toll of captive elephants had risen to crisis levels. They believed neither the African nor Asian elephant population was sustainable under current conditions. They all agreed to speak and act with a unified voice in claiming that elephants were thriving in zoos. Together they hired a crisis management team and agreed to dub critics of elephants in captivity as extremists. They also committed in writing to aggressively breed elephants. And that is exactly what they did. And they needed to take that approach because breeding elephants in captivity had long been a problematic process. The issues with zoos breeding elephants were present across all of the zoos in the United States, but the zoo that received the most scrutiny for their breeding practices was the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. Their breeding issues began in 1980 when Thai Airways gave gifted them a baby Asian elephant to promote their new overseas route. The elephant that was gifted to them was originally taken from the wild and she was also named Chai. Several years went by and then the zoo decided that they wanted to try and breed their elephants. After doing some blood tests, they determined that Chai was the best option for breeding. They had two options for how they could go about that. They could send her to another zoo to be mated with, but the transport would be costly and they wouldn't be able to display her for almost a year. Or artificial insemination was an option as well. At the time, it was very experimental and no zoo had successfully impregnated an elephant, but still that was the route that they decided to go. Because it was a very unnatural and invasive procedure, keepers had to train Chai to accept artificial insemination. First First, they had to teach her how to stand still for long periods of time without panicking. Zookeepers chained Chai's four legs to anchors, pulling them tight so that she couldn't move an inch, a technique called short chaining. In the next phase, zookeepers got her used to having a long, flexible hose inserted into her winding, three foot long reproductive tract. Zookeepers conducted mock inseminations on Chai for about two years. After four years and 91 attempts at artificial insemination, they had no luck. So they started to consider sending her to the Dickerson Park Zoo in Missouri to be mated with. That zoo had experienced a breakout of lethal elephant herpes. That virus can lay dormant in elephants and then flare up at random times. And when it does, it is almost always a death sentence. It eats away at the tissue of their internal organs and elephants can die of it in just days and sometimes hours. Even though Chai was more than likely going to contract the herpes and also bring it back to Seattle, they sent her anyway. According to Bruce Baumke, the herpes virus can be found in the wild. Therefore, to find a cure, experts need to keep studying herpes viruses and that the benefits of breeding elephants outweighs the risk. But critics say that's playing Russian roulette with these animals. Well, I, I would respond, number one, I've seen dead baby elephants in the wild myself. It does happen in the wild, so it's not like we're doing something special to them. They don't, wouldn't happen in the wild. Upon her arrival at the Dickerson Zoo, there were already many issues. At the zoo she came from in Seattle, zookeepers characterized her as shy and submissive, with no history of aggression. Within her first three days at Dickerson Park, zookeepers said that she turned dangerous and required restraints and physical punishment. She was chained by two legs and struck with a bull hook. And for treating her that way, the Dickerson Park Zoo received a $5,000 fine for violating the Animal Welfare Act. The citation said they caused her trauma, behavioral stress, physical harm and unnecessary discomfort. Chai also had a hard time being accepted by the existing herd there. Some elephants gouged and rammed her body, 
Keep has placed her in protective captivity after one elephant bit off a piece of her tail. According to medical records, her weight and health rapidly deteriorated. Zookeepers even decided to dose Chai with azapurone, a tranquilizer to calm her down and make her easier to handle, as well as Valium, an anti-anxiety medication. When Chai was returned to Seattle, she was in fact pregnant. On November 3rd, 2000, Chai gave birth to a girl who was named Hansa, the Thai word for supreme happiness. With any animal that's born, you know, you have to stimulate it to get it to breathe. There was a period of time when the baby did not move, and I actually had the sinking sensation that it was still born. And then it moved. And I felt the tragedy turn to ecstasy. And then your next, your next concern is, is it going to be viable? Is it going to try to get up? You know, we saw that behavior. She started lifting her head, she started looking around, and she started, you know, doing the curly shuffle, trying to get up on her feet. Uh, there have been a lot of elephant calves rejected by their mothers initially after birth, and that have never been successfully raised. A, a, a calm response was what I was hoping for. <laughs> With a baby elephant at the zoo, revenue and donations doubled. Apparently, the zookeepers called Hansa Cash Cow. So when Hansa started to grow and grow out of her cuteness, the zoo decided to try and artificially inseminate Chai once again. But once again, it was also unsuccessful. And then when Hansa was just six years old, she was found dead on the floor of the elephant's night pen. A necropsy revealed she died of the herpes virus. Zoo officials weren't sure which elephant gave it to her, since there was no test to detect the virus in its dormant phase. But two months after Hansa's death, the virus once again claimed another elephant life at the Dickerson Park Zoo. So it was likely transmitted to Chai when she was at that zoo, and then to Hansa through pregnancy, and was just yet to flare up in Chai and kill her. And attempts to artificially inseminate Chai were still failures, in December 2011, the total attempts were at 112, but even if she got pregnant through this approach, it was unlikely the baby would survive. Miscarriages and premature and stillborn deaths from artificial insemination pregnancies were at 54%. Of the 27 successful artificial pregnancies since 1999, Eight resulted in miscarriages or stillborn deaths. An additional six calves were quick to die from disease, including the herpes virus. The overall infant mortality rate for elephants in zoos is a staggering 40% nearly triple the rate in the Asian or African wild. And that was not good news for zoos because in order to sustain the captive population, zoos would need to make 10 female baby elephants every year. But in 2012, which was the year when the Seattle Times did their elephant investigation, eight elephants had already died that year and only three had been born. And in 2012, the Woodland Park Zoo finally gave up on trying to artificially inseminate Chai. And then in 2016, after being taken from the wild as a baby, enduring abuse from zookeepers, losing a daughter, receiving relentless invasive pregnancy attempts, Chai died at the age of 37. And what Chai went through is just one example of what many elephants go through in zoos. Also, Chai didn't die at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. In 2014, they opted to close their elephant exhibit. They had two elephants at the time, Chai and Bamboo. Zoo officials decided to send them to Oklahoma City Zoo, but a lawyer for the Elephant Justice Project filed a lawsuit to try and block the transfer. Animal advocates wanted the elephants sent to a sanctuary instead, but unfortunately a federal judge denied the request. In the decision, the judge said that moving the elephants is unlikely to result in any harm beyond that already incurred due to the very fact of Chai and Bamboo's existence as captive Asian elephants in the United States. There were protests to try and stop it, but nothing could be done, and Chai and Bamboo ended up at the Oklahoma City Zoo. They went from one concrete 
person to another, which I had been displaying and continued to display what is known as zoocosis. Zoocosis is a form of psychosis that develops in animals held in zoos. Most often it manifests in what are called stereotypic behaviours or stereotypies, which are often monotonous, obsessive, repetitive actions that serve no purpose. It is how chai and other elephants cope with stress, boredom, and trauma. In 2022, Bamboo met the same fate as Chai and died from declining health. On Bamboo's profile on the Woodland Park Zoo's website, it said that Bamboo learned to unlock doors, unscrew bolts, and dismantle locks. She wasn't ever able to unlock a door to freedom, but many elephants have made it to freedom. There have been a number of instances where elephants have escaped zoos. Ali the elephant ventured through a gate that was left open at the Jacksonville Zoo. Burma, an elephant in Auckland, New Zealand, escaped after dropping a log on the electric fence around her enclosure. Hope, an elephant at the Denver Zoo, simply stepped over a three foot high barrier in a bathing area to make it to freedom. But not all zoo elephants escape as quietly as those ones or remain quiet once they escape. Cindy at a Californian wildlife park charged at a zookeeper and then forced herself out the gate and continued to attack the keeper outside of the cage. Witnesses said they saw him beating her with a bullhook before the attack. Nobby the elephant from the Chester Zoo was acting aggressively on the street and had to be shot when he couldn't be tranquilized. And zoos aren't the only place that captive elephants try to escape from. Plenty of circus elephants have also escaped and they will often take it one step further. They will seek revenge. Black Diamond was walking in a parade in Texas when he saw an old abusive trainer in the crowd. He snapped off his chains and ran after him, breaking his arm and killing the woman he was with. Tyke, who is probably one of the most famous elephant escapes, killed her trainer, severely injured an elephant groomer, and circus publicist, and ran through the streets until she was shot down. An investigation discovered her owners were abusive. Regardless of whether or not elephants escaped peacefully, they all clearly wanted a life free from confinement. And considering how intelligent elephants are, I don't think it is much of a stretch to say that Bamboo knew exactly what she was doing when she was unscrewing bolts and dismantling locks. Actions do speak louder than words, but one animal that was able to communicate words to humans was a chimpanzee named Washo. Washo was a female chimpanzee who was the first non-human to learn to communicate using American Sign Language. And at a point during the research on her, she was locked in a small cage indoors. In the book, Primatology, Ethics and Trauma by Robert Ingersoll, it was revealed that she continuously signed, key out, walk there, hurry. She wanted to be free. And I'm sure if elephants could sign, they would also be signing key out. While me and you can determine that elephants want out of their confinement through their repetitive behaviours, health issues and inability to thrive in a zoo setting, it goes ignored by most zoo officials. However, the AZA has slightly changed their opinion on elephant sanctuaries. In 2017, they granted accreditation to the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee, but it doesn't mean they would recommend a zoo send an elephant there even when it's in their best interests. Lucy the Elephant is a lone elephant at the AZA accredited zoo in Edmonton Valley Zoo, Canada. For years now, protests and petitions have been calling for the relocation of Lucy, and her lone existence at the zoo even violates two sections of the AZA guidelines. One part is facilities must provide an opportunity for each elephant to exercise and interact socially with other elephants unless under extenuating circumstances. In another part, it says, elephant management facilities should make every effort to maintain elephants in social groupings. 
it is inappropriate to keep highly social female elephants singly long term. So the fact that the AZA isn't threatening to revoke the accreditation of the Edmonton Valley Zoo when they are in violation of the guidelines, but will happily threaten to revoke the accreditation of zoos who send their elephants to sanctuaries is concerning. And Lucy has been alone since 2007, so they have been violating those guidelines for a long time and have had a long time to do what is right by Lucy. In the description, there will be a link to an automated letter that you can send to the local government in Canada, which addresses the Lucy situation. All you have to do is put your name and your city and click send. There will also be another link in the description to a website site all about Lucy, which tells her story and what's been going on with her. As for the 17 elephants from Eswatini, Warren, one of the bull elephants, died. In 2017, at the age of eight or nine, while under anesthesia for surgery on a cracked tusk, he died. One of the female elephants named Melilo was actually pregnant when she made the journey and she gave birth to a baby boy a few months later in August 2016 who was named Ajabu. Soon after birth he contracted the herpes virus and it fled in 2001. He was actually able to survive that but then it fled again in 2003 and that was when he died. It is estimated that captive elephants in US zoos could be demographically extinct within the next 50 years because there'll be too few fertile females left to breed. But in the meantime, they will likely know nothing but suffering. On this channel, I have made videos about gorillas in zoos and orcas in captivity, and those animals cannot exist in captivity without having a host of health issues. And elephants are the same. So please take that into consideration when thinking about supporting a zoo. So that is pretty much everything for this video. Thank you so much for watching and let's take a moment of silence for all of the elephants in captivity in zoos. And I will see you in my next video.